Mr. John Salsa. Ivan Maria, <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here with you uh, this evening. It's my uh, privilege to be here to talk about many uh, different Catholic topics this week. The first of which is going to be the virtue of chastity and purity and the sins uh, that one can commit against that. I will tell you, this is a hard-hitting topic, okay? And I'm not going to pull many punches. Uh, this is a very important topic. Um, you guys are bombarded with images with messages and so forth that that want to lead you astray and lead you away from the virtue of purity and of chastity so we're going to address those issues today it's a very significant topic and i'm glad i'm talking about it when i teach the uh, the catholic faith this isn't coming from me uh, this is coming from what the church says so i rely on the catechisms the councils the saints the fathers the doctors of the church that's where i get my information from you don't want to hear from me you want to hear from from uh, those brilliant minds of, of the church. And when I present the faith, I want to communicate to you what the church teaches. That's important. What is the dogma of the church? What does the church say about these matters? But also, when I teach, I talk about the errors that threaten the dogmas of the faith, the heresies, things that you need to be aware of as well. That's why the church not only promulgates doctrine, but it also condemns errors against the doctrine. And we need to know both when we talk about what the church teaches. So with that, what is chastity? Where does that word come from? Well, it comes from the word chastise. And what does chastise mean? It means to punish, right? When you, ch when you get chastised, you're, you're punished. And so the word chastity takes its name from, from, from chastisement, which means that we really are bringing our body into subjection. You know, we're created in the image and likeness of God, but with the original sin, you've learned the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, things got haywire. Uh, and so chastity refers to trying to tame these lower passions, you know, this, this disordered desire for pleasures, you know, whether it be physical pleasures or food or whatever, and subject them to right reason. That's what chastity is. And St. Paul talks about this a lot in the scriptures, where he says, I, I chastise my body and I bring it into subjection. The rule being that you want your reason and your intellect to dominate how you use your body. You don't want your passions, your lower faculties, your lower appetites to govern. Because if that happens, what do you become? You become an animal. And we're not animals. God created us in his image and likeness. And what distinguishes us from the animals is that we have reason, we have an intellect, and we have free will. Okay, and God has given us this most incredible gift of free will to exercise for his glory. In fact, that's the only way we really can love somebody is by exercising free will. That's why it's such a precious gift. God respects our choices. He respects our free will because ultimately he wants us to love him to exercise our will to be united with his will. So that's what really what chastity is all about, using your intellect and your will to govern your body in accordance with right reason for the greater glory of God and ultimately for your own salvation. And today, you know, you're bombarded with messages that are contrary to that. TV, music, the Internet. All of these images that you receive and messages that want to arouse your passions and lead you away from this virtue. You know, we are living truly in a crisis of morality in the church right now. And this crisis in morality is manifested in sins of impurity. And if you study the prophecies, especially from Our Lady, Our Lady warned that this was going to happen 300 years ago. I'm going to talk about this later in the week when she came to Quito, Ecuador in the 17th century, late 16th and early 17th century. You know what she said there? <clears throat> she said that sins of impurity would saturate the atmosphere in the 20th century. In fact, she was even more specific than that. She said just after the middle of the 20th century, the church will be overcome by this vice of impurity. That was incredible. This is a church-approved prophecy in Quito, Ecuador. It's known uh, as Our Lady of Good Success. She appeared at Quito. Well, what happened just after the middle of the 20th century? 
there was that thing called the sexual revolution, okay, where all of a sudden people abandoned the virtues, abandoned the church, and said, if it feels good, do it. The 60s was one of the most destructive decades in, in world history, and a lot of it had to do with these sins of impurity that Our Lady warned about. Our Lady, who is the mother of purity, she warned the church of this. Now, why are we in this condition that we're in? We talked about this war between the lower appetites and the intellect. Well, I mentioned the fall of Adam and Eve. Yes, Adam and Eve are our first parents. They're real people. That's what the church teaches dogmatically. They existed, and God gave them a divine command, and they disobeyed it. And as a punishment for that disobedience, God allowed their passions uh, to, to wage war with their reason. Now, why would God do something like that? The church, by the way, calls that concupiscence. You look in the catechism, this concupiscence is this disordered desire for pleasures of the flesh. And I said God did it, first of all, to punish them for disobedience, but when God punishes, he always is doing it in a remedial sense. He wants to bring us back to him. And so he let Adam and Eve in this condition of having to fight to overcome their passions so that they would ultimately realize that they could only rely on God, not themselves. Okay, so when you feel these temptations, God has allowed that to exist because God wants you to realize that you can't win that battle without him. He wants you to turn to him as your father. That's why he's allowed our passions to enter into this battle, and it is a battle. And so God wants us to know and wants us to realize that we are completely reliant upon him. And how do we overcome these, tab these temptations? How do we do it? Well, it's only by grace. St. Paul says we can't do it ourselves. Jesus said, without me, you can do what? You can do nothing. He didn't say you can do some things. You might be okay in this area. No, he says you can do nothing. And so how do we receive the grace? We'll receive the grace through the sacramental life of the church by being faithful to the sacraments. That's the only way that we're going to win this battle. Now, sins against this virtue of chastity uh, are very, very difficult to overcome. St. Ambrose says, and I'm quoting, he was one of the early fathers of the church, he says that whoever has preserved chastity is an angel and that he who has lost it is a devil. Our Lord assures us that those who are chaste will become like angels. They will be like angels before the Father in heaven. And St. Augustine, one of the greatest saints of the church, recognizing even way back when that this was such a difficult vice to overcome, he said that those people who fall into sins of impurity, most of them don't overcome it. That should be scary. And they don't overcome it because they don't live the life of the, the sacramental life of the church. Recently, Our Lady, I'm going to talk about this later in the week, she came to Fatima, and, and the Fatima apparitions are the most important apparitions that God has given since the time of Christ, the messages that she gave at Fatima. One of the things that she said at Fatima that she revealed to one of the children, little Jacinta, Our Lady told her that most souls go to hell for sins of impurity. Most souls go to hell for sins of impurity. Why did Our Lady reveal that? Well, she, she saw the crisis that was forthcoming. And when you read the detail of those encounters with little Jacinta, this was in 1917. And Jacinta, in communication with Our Lady during World War II, it happened shortly after that, she said, you know, Holy Mother, most of the souls are going to hell for these sins. And when I read these accounts, I have to ask myself, the world wasn't practicing these vices the way they are today. Homosexuality, contraception, abortion, you name it. The world wasn't practicing those vices the way they were, the way they are today. And yet even back then, almost 100 years ago, Our Lady revealed that souls were going to hell for these crimes. So what does that say about the state of our society today? It's not good. It shows how much we need our Lord to save us from such a fate. To understand the gift of human sexuality, we need to really go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve as husband and wife 
to reflect the image of Christ and his church. Just as the, the husband and wife in their union bring forth natural life, so Christ and the church bring forth supernatural life. And what does that tell you? That tells you that the point of sexuality is life-giving. That is the predominant objective of human sexuality. Life-giving through this covenant communion between a husband and a wife. Because St. Paul says that is the image of Christ and the church, as Christ gave his body up for his church in this life-giving way of grace. So the husband and wife in that sacred act bring forth new life. And so anything that relates to human sexuality between a man and a woman is always ordered to marriage. It's necessarily that way because that's how God created it. And I will tell you that message over and over and over again. If there's any thought you have or any act, if it's not ordered to marriage, it doesn't belong in your life. It's not for you. You don't have a right to that good because it's meant for the husband and the wife. And so sexuality, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church says in paragraph 2360 says, it is ordered to the marital bond, which is a sacrament. Marriage must last until death. What God has joined, let no man put asunder. So this union that we're talking about is unbreakable by any human power. And we certainly can see the attack upon the sanctity of marriage, unfortunately, in our time. The government trying to denote you know, marriage, demote it to a, just a civil union, a contract. And why do they want to do that? Well, contracts can be broken. Covenants cannot be broken. And this is a grave error. And it's an error that Catholics need to speak out against. We should be outraged at what the government is trying to do to the sacrament that God has given us. And so when we reflect on God's creation, his creation of Adam and Eve, what did he tell them? as part of their journey together. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. This was a divine command from God. And so the primary purpose of the procreation, uh, of, the, of the act, the marital act, is for the procreation and education of children. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in 2363 says there's a twofold obligation. It says fecundity and fidelity. But the church has always taught that the primary end of the marital act is for life. It's for children. And that is important. The message that we're receiving today is it's for pleasure only. Well, God made it that way, of course, as a gift to the spouses, but the primary end is to populate heaven. That's really what it's for. And once, we, once that takes root in our hearts and our souls, we realize how perverted, how perverted the world looks at sexuality. It's completely antithetical, completely opposed to what God has designed. And again, we need to speak out against that. We need to support what our Lord has given us. Now, it's usually infidelity of some type of sexual sin that causes divorce today. And with this revolution that I talked about, you know, it's sad to say that, you know, Catholics, the divorce rate among Catholics is just as... as, uh, as uh, the same as it is with non-Catholics. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Um, and so this vice has even rooted itself in the church as Our Lady warned. And that's why it's important that we're, we're talking about this. When Our Lady said that most souls go to hell because of sins of impurity, she was revealing that these sins are the most difficult to overcome. And the church has uh, taught this over and over again. They're the most addictive and the most debilitating. As I said, they can make us become like animals because we're not subjecting our body to reason. They really, they rot the soul. And that's why we must flee from any occasion of impurity. And St. Paul says in the scriptures to his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verses 18 to 20, he says, all other sins that people may commit are done outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you receive from God? You are not your own property then, he says. You have been bought at a price, so use your body for the glory of God. 
So what St. Paul is saying there is these vices of impurity and immorality, they take over the body. They invert. They invert the, the, the intellect and the will, and they subject it to the passions. And it's supposed to be the other way around. That's why he's saying these are sins that are truly committed in the body because they invert that order that God has established. Why did he allow it? Because he wants us to come to him, to come to his church for the grace. He wants us to come to him as a father. He wants us to give our lives totally to him and realize that we can't do this on our own. Once we think we can do it on our own, we're, we're finished. It's not going to happen. So these sins of impurity, and I'm going to talk about these sins, they, they wrap themselves around the senses, and they darken the intellect. They weaken the will. When you commit a sin of impurity, one of the consequences is that your will becomes weak. It's almost more difficult to overcome it. And if it's repeated, it will become way more difficult to overcome. That's a consequence of all sins, but it's especially the sin of impurity. The mind becomes dark and the will becomes weakened. In the Catechism, uh, in, in paragraph 2332, it says, in fact, this. that It says that these sins affect all aspects of the human person in both the body and in the soul. And if you read what the Catechism says, it points out the various aspects of that. In the mind, for example, more lustful thoughts may enter the mind, the eyes. You know, are you using your eyes, curiosity, glances, viewing images, reading improper materials, the ears, indecent speech, you know, lewd stories, songs, the mouth, the speech, and so forth. So these types of sins that are against this virtue of chastity, which is chastising or punishing the body and bringing up subjection, involves the body as a whole. And because it, it involves all of the senses, these types of sins really consume the person. They consume him in body and soul. And it does then lead to other evils. Because once the mind has been darkened and the will has been weakened, we notice that these types of sins can lead to other evils because the heart becomes hardened. And so it's important that we are aware of what the church says in these matters. Let's talk about uh, some of the, the sins specifically, again, referring to, uh, to the catechism. Of course, physical acts. We talked about how the marital act is intended to be exclusively for the husband and the wife. And in Scripture, St. Paul says again in his letter to the Corinthians, do you not realize that people who do evil will never inherit the kingdom of God? Make no mistake, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, sodomites, thieves, misers, drunkards, and so forth, they will not enter in the kingdom of God. Hebrews 13, 4, St. Paul says the same thing. He says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. St. Paul is talking about those sins that are committed outside of the marital, uh, the marital covenant. Jesus himself says, if your right eye should be your downfall, tear it out and throw it away. For it will do you less harm to lose one part of yourself than to have your whole body thrown into hell. We're familiar with that, that statement from Matthew 5 uh, in the Sermon of the Mount. What Jesus is saying there is if there's anything in your life that leads you into impurity, you have to get rid of it. That's a sign that you're truly repentant and you have a firm purpose to amend your life. If you keep committing the same sins over and over again and you haven't removed the occasion of sin, that means you're really not sorry for it. And this is a crisis right now in the church. I can, I can tell you, uh, talking to... Uh, priests that do missions like this and hear a lot of confessions, they say one of the things that is really, really difficult is youth, and this is adults too, going into the confession and confessing these sins, and thank God they are using the sacraments. But do they have a firm purpose of amendment? This is very important, and I'll be talking more about this when we talk about penance. If a person is habitually committing these sins, you have to tell the priest this has become a habit, and the priest has to help you. The priest should be asking if these are mortal sins, what are the conditions for these sins? Why are you continuing to commit them? Do you have a firm purpose to amend? And the way you evidence that is by eliminating whatever that temptation is
from your life. It's very important. We can't use the confessional as a revolving door, right? We need to make sure that we truly have an amendment, and then God will certainly grant us the graces to overcome, overcome those. The Catechism talks about a number of, of sins. Uh, I mentioned adultery, uh, impure acts with oneself. The Catechism in 2352, that's masturbation. That's the word that the Catechism uses. This is a mortal sin. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not. It is a mortal sin. And if you commit that sin and you're not absolved and you don't have a firm purpose of amendment, you'll go to hell if you die. That's a fact. It's a mortal sin, and, and, and it's one of those sins that can become addictive. And so, you know, I would encourage whoever, God will forgive you. That's what the sacraments are for. But you need to talk to the priest about any circumstances that are leading you into those sins and seek that spiritual guidance. Fornication is in Catechism 2353. That is, again, sexual activity between non-married people. Uh, couples. It could be adultery too, only that refers to fornication with married couples. Um, St. Thomas says, and St. Thomas is one of the great doctors of the church. In fact, he's called the universal doctor of the church. And he says, take heed to keep thyself from all fornication and beside thy wife never endure to know a crime. Now crime denotes, uh, denotes a mortal sin, therefore fornication and all intercourse with another other than one's wife is a mortal sin. Now let's just review what a mortal sin is. It's important to understand what, what that is when I say that. Church says that a mortal sin regards grave matter. The matter must be grave. You must have sufficient knowledge of it. You must understand that it's grave. And then you must go forward and commit the sin using your act of the will, full consent of the will. So grave matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. That constitutes a mortal sin. And the saints have told us that there are people in hell who've only committed one mortal sin. It's in God's providence how, how that happens. We now have a chance to go to the confessional and make sure that we're never in mortal sin. I pray to God that he strike me dead in a state of grace before I ever commit a mortal sin. That's my prayer to him every day. That's how serious this is. You can talk about the unexpected. People die unexpectedly all the time, all the time. In fact, most people who die, they didn't expect to die. What happens if they're in a state of mortal sin? They're going to hell. Okay, they're going to go to hell. And we don't want to go there. And the church doesn't want us to go there. And Christ doesn't want us to go there. That's why we're talking about this. I told you this was hard hitting. But again, based on what Our Lady said, Our Lady herself, I didn't say this, Our Lady said that most souls are going to hell for these sins. And so I want you to be aware of how grave this subject matter is. Again, one of my messages is, and I said this before, any act that could lead to the marital act, the marital brace, is reserved for marriage, period. Remember that. Any act that would necessarily lead to the marital act is reserved for marriage. And so that would include heavy kissing, touching, feeling, all of these things that would lead to the marital act belong in marriage and that's it. Otherwise it is an occasion of sin. And when we talk about occasion of sin and we talk about mortal sin and grave matter, remember the first requirement for a mortal sin is it has to be grave. In this area of human sexuality, it's always grave. It's grave matter. And that means if you put yourself in the occasion of a sin, even if you don't commit a sin of impurity, if you put yourself in the occasion where you could, that itself is a mortal sin. That's what the church teaches. You cannot put yourself in the occasion of sin because if you do, you're going to fall. You're going to fall if you put yourself in that occasion. And so that's what we need to understand in the context of serious sin. So um, uh, we mentioned that the act is ordered to the good of marriage. Uh, anything that would lead to the act has to be reserved for marriage. The other thing I want to mention, and you know, people may not have heard this before, but I'm just telling you what the church has always said, this aspect of dating, you know, where a guy and a girl go out. I mean, I wasn't in high school that long ago, and I, I know what goes on, but the church has always talked about a holy courtship, a holy courtship between a guy and a gal, and that usually happens in the context of the family, you know, where you invite a person in, you meet the parents, 
I know being an Italian, my mother, she knew this. She would say, that one's not you know, right for you or this one's. I mean, they, they know. The, par the parents, they know. So, you know, this, this idea of, of courtship, we've lost it. We've lost it. And I did a little bit of research on this, and I said, where did this concept of dating come? Because even in, in my relatives are from Italy, and courtship was, it would happen exclusively in the old country. It would happen exclusively in the family. It was wonderful. I mean, I know my grandparents and aunts and uncles, they didn't kiss till that veil was lifted on, on the wedding day, and we can't fathom that now. But you know where it started? It started with the invention of the automobile. You know, where people would then would go out and, again, is it an occasion of sin? Yeah, it, it usually is going to be an occasion of sin. If you have a guy and a gal and they are attracted to each other and they're going out, that's an occasion of sin. And you have to be careful. So, you know, hopefully courtship will be restored at some point. You know, where this is done in the context of the family, it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful thing. And, and priests will tell you this as they work with couples, there's virtually no divorce in, in courtships when you have that type of formation, that good Catholic formation. Whereas now, as I said before, and I work with the, the marriage tribunal, I know the statistics, over 50% of Catholics are, are getting divorced. And there's been an annulment fiasco that's just out of hand. And this is the kind of history that, that leads to it. So I want you to be, be aware of that. We've talked about what the catechism has said about physical acts. And, you know, these are sensitive topics, so I don't like getting in a lot of detail. That's not necessary. When you talk about these things, you have to be prudent in the way you talk. You have to be, you have to exercise good prudence and, and Catholic judgment. So that we don't need to get into the details, but you know where I'm coming from and what I'm talking about when I raise these things. It's not just, you know, the physical acts. It's the mental as well. And this is important. Not only do you have to overcome the physical, but when I talked about the intellect controlling the passions, it's in the mind as well. To really achieve true holiness that God desires for us, it has to start in the mind and in the heart. St. James says that in the, his epistle. He says these sins of impurity are born in the heart and in the mind, and that's what makes them so wicked. They come out of the heart of man. And so it has to start there. And, and our Lord Jesus Christ you know, it sets this out in the gospel. And he says, you have heard how it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say this to you, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Remember our Lord said that. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. In the book of Proverbs, it says, lust not after her, her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with thy eyelids. And in Exodus, you shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. So these sins really start in the heart and in the mind. And I talked about being bombarded with images on cell phones, on the Internet. I look at this, and I'm like, Lord, there's so many opportunities for us to fall. How do we overcome this? And, you know, he tells you, you have such an opportunity to overcome these to be great saints. You know, all the great saints of the church, they didn't have the temptations that we had today, which tells me we have an opportunity to really share in God's glory with his grace if we can, if we can be victorious in this battle. But the catechism not only talks about these acts, but they talk about the sins with the eyes, the sins in the mind. Catechism 2354, pornography, it says in the catechism, which it says, you know, pictures, video, internet, television, movies. All of these are a type of fornication. If, if you are intentionally looking at these images to become aroused, that is a grave sin. You can't do it. You have to flee that. Okay? We can't drive our cars and keep our eyes closed, obviously, but you've got to look away. You've got to build up that virtue now. For those who are intentionally doing it, that's a grave sin. <laughs> and we have, to, we have to be cognizant of, of that. Our Lord says it in here. And again, this isn't coming from me or Father Paul or Father Andy. Our Lord says, if you look at a woman, even lustfully, it is adultery. And what does St. Thomas say? Well, St. Thomas says that adultery is a mortal sin. Therefore, if our Lord is equating the desire, even if you don't do the act, the desire is itself the same sin. And, and this is what makes it so difficult because it is so easy to fall into these sins now. 
again, with all of the electronic media uh, that's out there. Um, we talked about putting oneself in the occasion. If you go to Our Lady, of course, you're never going to fall. She's the mother of chastity and the mother of purity, and we need to go to her. Um, I want to talk, again, I mentioned this briefly, uh, the habitual sins. Unfortunately, there are some you know, people who are committing these sins habitually. You have to really work with your priest on overcoming these. That's called a recidivist sinner. Those who commit the sin, they go to confession, but there's no amendment of life. If the internet is causing you to sin, you got to get rid of it. Your parents got to put controls on it, or you got to put some password on it, or some filters. You, you got to get rid of the stuff. If you have impure images on the phone, you got to get rid of it. That shows God that you're serious about this. If you don't remove the occasion, then you're not sorry. You're not serious. And then you have to examine your conscience. Do I really love our Lord? Do I really want holiness? Am I divided? You've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. And so this recidivist sin is, is a problem today because a lot of times people are going into the confessional and they're getting absolution over and over and over again. <clears throat> if there's no firm purpose of amendment and there are no remedies that have been taken, that's invalid. I can tell you that St. Alphonsus Liguri, he's a great doctor of the church, um, and the church says if confessors follow St. Alphonsus, they'll never err. St. Alphonsus teaches that after the third absolution, it's invalid if you don't have a firm purpose to amend your life. Be aware of that. I know in consulting with priests about this issue and in preparing for this, that this is one of the things that they're encountering, this revolving door syndrome. I say it's wonderful that they're going to the sacrament because there's some grace working there. They recognize what they're doing is wrong. Nobody is questioning that they're not sorry, but how sorry? Have they made a change in their life? That's why there has to be remedies. With absolution, there has to be remedies for the sin. As our Lord says, it's better that you go to heaven, you know, with one arm or one leg than to be cast into hell with your whole body. What he means by that is you have to eliminate, get rid of, even if it's your hand, figuratively, he says cut it off, means get rid of whatever is leading you into sin. Because you don't know how much time God is going to give you. You just don't. This is in God's providence. He may give one person a million mortal sins, and he may only give another person a hundred or one. We don't, we don't know. We don't know. That's why we have to strive to be in a state of grace every single day. I know you guys are young, and when I was young, I didn't think about dying, but there are a lot of kids that die your age. And what happens if they're not in a state of grace? So the serious, and the church says it's serious. So the Internet's obviously a huge issue. There should be controls on that, uh, filters. Uh, there was a, a, a venerable... Uh, Anna Marie Taigi, Italian uh, saint. And she said, uh, boy, it has to be, I don't know, maybe 60, 80 years ago. She said that the devil will infiltrate homes through a black box. That's what she said. That's the TV. That's the computer. And the more you frequent the sacraments and receive the Eucharist and pray, pray your rosary, go to communion, the more you will build up the grace and the virtue to overcome these temptations. And then you know what happens? The devil's not going to bother you as much. You know why? Because he doesn't want to be continually defeated. This is a battle. St. Paul says it very clearly in the scriptures. Even though our passions, we're in battle with our passions, St. Paul says that the ultimate foe is the devil and the demons. He says we battle against principalities and powers, you know, in the heavenly places. He's referring to that spiritual realm that we can't see. But it is true. Okay, it is true. The demons are fallen angels, and they watch you. They can't read your soul, but they watch you, and they see what you do. They see if you look at the Internet. They see what your temptations are, and they will then put thoughts into your head. They know how to tempt you. They do it by observing what you do. And so if you strive to overcome them, okay, they're going to tempt you for the rest of your life, but they don't want to be defeated all the time. God will allow them to leave, and you'll get a repose, and you'll have more grace to be successful then and in the future. 
some other particular sins, you know, for the guys, we've, we've talked about a lot of them, but, you know, even impure discussions with your buddies. And believe me, I know what that's like. I still have some friends that leave me some funny messages from time to time. But careful about, about that, okay? Don't boast about impure things. Train your mind to be pure. Don't boast about past sins. Remember our Lord said that every word, every idle word will be judged by God. You know, men, you have to be like Jesus Christ. You want to be a sign of contradiction in the world. And I'll tell you what, if you live a life of purity and a life of chastity, you will be that contradiction. You will be. And, and ladies, all of the things that I talked about also apply to you, but there's something else that I want to mention, and it's your dress. There has to be modesty in dress. We don't hear about this enough. And I'll give you a principle. Okay? The principle is this. Clothes are meant to conceal, not to reveal. Clothes are meant to conceal, not to reveal. This is very, very important. A lot of girls are just not dressing properly. And this leads men into sin. Because men will look, and, and if a woman is doing this intentionally, that becomes a grave sin. Now, not all women are dressing immodestly intentionally. That's not what we're saying. But if they are, you need to examine your conscience and you need to knock that off. Okay? Because that's not, that's a, that, that can lead to other sins, certainly if it's intentional. And so when we say clothes are meant to conceal, not to reveal, you know, short skirts, tight pants, things that are revealing, you know, that's not Catholic modesty. Your model should be Our Lady, and you want to be like her. You want to model her virtue of purity. You also don't want men to look at you as an object. You know, you're a child of God. You're created in the image and likeness of God, and you're called to be holy like he is holy. And so you don't want men to look at you as an object, and, and quite frankly, that's what men do when you dress that way. And you don't want that because you're better than that. They won't respect you. Uh, other things that come to mind when we talk about uh, you know, purity is certainly dress, it's certainly speech. All of these things are ordered. All of your speech, your dress, your actions have to be ordered to, to the good. Uh, you know, dancing, music, things like that. Be careful of that. The things that I, I hear in some of the li lyrics that people bring to my attention, very immodest. You know, it's almost uh, intentionally trying to incite people to these sins of purity, and they're boasting about it, too. These artists are boasting about sinning against God. It's, it's wicked, so be careful. Careful with that. We've talked about uh, the catechism's principles about human sexuality and how the act is ordered to uh, procreation and education of children belongs in the, uh, the marital covenant acts that are contrary to that virtue temptations. Uh, I want to touch on some other subjects. And, you know, I have, I have a privilege of going around the country and, and giving speeches, and, you know, I put some of this together based on the questions that, that I get. And I, I can't believe some of the things that are being taught in, in parishes. And so I want to talk about a couple of these other things. The first is contraception, okay? Uh, that is an intrinsic evil. That's what the catechism says. And that means, contraception means you're deliberately preventing life, okay, deliberately preventing conception. Pope John Paul II called it an evil. In his catechism in 2370, it's an intrinsic evil. Now, that's because, you know, some people say, well, that's, that's because, you know, you're separating life from love, and that's the reason why. That's not really the reason why contraception is evil, because God says it is. Remember when he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply the divine command? It's evil because God has declared it evil, and <clears throat> excuse me, and it's unnatural. It is an unnatural act, and so uh, the things that come up, you know, the, the pill, condoms, devices like that. I mean, if your doctor is putting you on the pill to regulate hormones, get a new doctor because that you, that doesn't need to happen. Okay, that puts a girl in the occasion of sin. Uh, the other things I mentioned uh, for contraceptive purposes, again. Those are intrinsically evil, even in the marriage. Even in the marriage. Married couples can't do that, of course. It's only married couples that should be engaged in the, in the marital embrace. But it's, I wanted to clear that up, okay, because 
travel to parishes where they say, well, you know, it, you can't, it's an absolute. When something's intrinsically evil, there are no exceptions to it. The act by, it, by its very self is, is evil. And this notion of separating life from love, that could be a consequence of the act. But there are people who get pregnant while using contraception. Well, there was no separation of life from love there because a child was conceived. So that could be a consequence of contraception, but it's not the reason why. The reason why is it's unnatural, and God has said so. The, the pill, the other thing about the pill, and I've talked to doctors about this, is it's an abortifacient, which means conception could occur, but the pill prevents the embryo from attaching into the uterine wall, actually killing the child in the womb. That's what the pill can, can do. You need to be aware of that. Uh, both guys and girls about that. Vasectomies, this is something you know that many adults have had. You know, what does the church say about that? Well, I'll tell you what the church says. The church says you've got to reverse them unless there's a medical necessity that you can't do it. I mean, if there's medical reasons why you can't do it, then you shouldn't do it. But if you don't want to do it because it's going to hurt, well, it hurt the first time you did it. Okay, so the church, you talk to moral theologians about this and confessors. Um, that, again, is a form of contraception. Um, so those topics have come up in my talks. The other topic I want to touch on, too, um, is homosexuality. Uh, of course, we know that the government you know, is endorsing this, this lifestyle, and I can't believe what public schools are doing. You guys are blessed to be here with, in this Catholic in, environment. But the public schools are actually telling these children that it is a, a permissible lifestyle. I heard one uh, school say, you know, try it. It's like spinach, you know, if you like it. I mean, it's incredible what's going on. Uh, but, but even in some private schools, I've noticed that some of the teachers are saying, well, this is you know, biological, and they really can't help that. That is not true. I'm going to say this right now. Homosexuality is not biological. It is an acquired vice. I'll say it again, homosexuality is not biological, it is an acquired vice, it is a decision. St. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1. He says that homosexuality is a consequence of idolatry. He says that these people were not worshiping God, they were worshiping the creature rather than the creator, and God handed them over to their shameful passions. And when it says God handed them over, he punished them by withdrawing his grace. And, and I bring this up because the message that you guys are bombarded with is, you know, if it feels good, do it. You really can't control your passions. It's just biological. That is nonsense. That is an anti-Catholic message. That's why I bring this up, because it comes up in the context of homosexuality, too. Well, they can't help it. Well, you know, you, that's not true. God didn't create us for that. So it is not biological. St. Paul clearly says it's not. And... You know, they also say, well, you know, John, you've got to distinguish between, you know, the person and the sin, the sinner and the sin, you know, as if that does something. Well, no, you don't. God throws the sinner into hell, not just the sin. You read scripture. This homosexuality is one of the four mortal sins that cry to God for his vengeance. It is one of the most wicked vices that there is, and we're not hearing that in the Catholic Church enough today problem is that that vice has entered into the church, even into the priesthood, unfortunately. You're blessed to have great priests here, but that's not the case. I just came from a parish, and it's very sad where, you know, accusations came out and the priest was removed. And I defend priests. I defend priests in the tribunal. I don't like the fact that if a priest is accused, he's automatically removed from ministry. I don't think that's right. I think the priest should have an opportunity to defend himself because I know the false accusations that are, that are out there. But this is something that Our Lady said at Quito, again, that those apparitions they talked about in the 17th century, when she said that sexual perversion would enter into the church in the 20th century. You know, Pope Benedict in 2010 on his way to Fatima <clears throat> said that he was asked a question on the airplane flight. And he was asked by Father Lombardi, Father, do you think that the message of Fatima also relates to the clergy sexual abuse crisis? And Pope Benedict said, yes, it does. He said that what Our Lady was warning about is not necessarily those outside the church, but from sin within the church itself. 
And so again, this isn't my message. This is coming from the Pope and from Our Lady. Warning of these vices. You know, some people <laughs> have objected when I've talked about this and said, well, you know, this, you, you know you're talking about in Genesis chapter 19, that's the, uh, the passage where God rains fire and brimstone down upon the people for the sin of homosexuality. And I remember I was speaking once and somebody said it wasn't because of homosexuality, it was because of this sin of in inhospitality, they said. If you read the passage in Genesis 19, there were actually angels knocking at Lot's door and said, may we come in and have relations with you. It's one of the areas where you know, people that are on the other side of this argument uh, try, to, try to twist. But I'm telling you that the church, you can, you can see in Genesis 18 and 19 how God has condemned it. And, you know, St. Paul has written about it, uh, about homosexuality a lot in the scriptures. I could tell you quote after quote. I won't quote all of them, but uh, Romans 127, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 10. The word he uses for homosexuality literally means a man sexual relations. That's what it means. So it's very clear in the scriptures that this is a, another vice and it's another sin that's leading souls to ruin. And we need to be... We need to speak out on this because our government is trying to ram it down our kids' throats. And as Catholics, we need to stand up and be Catholics. I also want to talk about, um, well, before I move on to that, uh, the New Testament uh, says a number of things. In, in 2 Peter, St. Peter, the first pope, uh, he describes the acts of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as sensual conduct of unprincipled men and lawless deeds. He was referring to the unnatural vices. Uh, Jude 7 also describes Sodom and Gomorrah as having, quote, indulged in immorality and went after strange flesh. So the Bible is clear about this. And in fact, in, in the epistle to Jude, in the same verse, it says that the Sodomites are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire for their sins. Okay, so people say, well, the Bible doesn't say anybody's in hell. Well, St. Jude says that the Sodomites are in hell for their sins of homosexuality. They're suffering for those sins. So it is a vice, and we need to oppose it. We need to be Catholic in the world. The other thing that has come up that I, I should touch upon uh, is this notion of this theology of the body. Uh, Pope John Paul II gave some uh, talks about this during his pontificate, and uh, you know some of them are quite good. But what I've heard, and I'm just sharing my experiences with you in my travels, I've heard some teachers call this theology of the body, which is kind of a self-contradictory term. Theology is the study of God. But it's the messages that they're giving the kids I take issue with. And I want to talk a bit about that. There's this exaggerated role when you talk about theology of the body. It's this exaggerated focus on, on man and his pleasure and his sexuality. Um, it's, it's hard to articulate this other than to say that I've heard some of these teachers say that the conjugal act is somehow a supernatural means of sanctification which is, it's not true. The, the marital act is a wonderful good that God has given, but it's a passing natural act, okay? Of course, our sexuality will always be a spiritual com component to it because we're body and soul. But trying to explain the supernatural by means of the natural uh, is an error that the church has called reductionism, and it permeates this thinking, everything focused on the human uh, sexual uh, pleasure and desire. And that's something that really has no basis in Catholic tradition. You know, what the church has always said is refraining from the carnal appetites is what sanctifies the soul, not engaging in it. You see, that's the, the, the message that I take issue with when these, these theology of the body people, they say this is a means of sanctification. It's, it's not a means of sanctification. Refraining from it is. You know, that would be news to saints like Maria Goretti, not to mention Jesus, Mary, and jo Joseph. You know, the, the truth is just the opposite, and that is that abstaining from the pleasures of the flesh helps one grow in holiness. And St. Paul teaches this clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you go read it. And he says, the flesh is at war with the spirit, and we were able to grow in the uh, spiritual life only by taming uh, the passions. So we can't equate a passing natural good with a supernatural good of sanctification. As our Lord says, there's going to be no marriages, no physical relations in heaven. We will all be like the angels. So I see an error in that teaching. And I think it's, a, it's an important error. 
Because what about our faithful celibate priests and our virginal nuns? They're living a life that's even closer to God. They're, they're in union with God because they don't have, they don't have the, the same, uh, I guess, temptations, you would say. There are more temptations, I think, in, in, in the context of a marriage, which is also not emphasized. Um, but they are living in a closer union with God, having renounced the pleasures of the flesh. And God certainly gives them the graces to do that for those wonderful uh, vocations. There's also an emphasis in theology of the body on the risk of committing mortal sins. We talked about mortal sin, grave matter, sufficient reflection, consent of the will. Fact is, there are a lot of risks even between married couples. Just because you're married does not give you a license to do anything you want to do. Married couples have to be chased just like single couples, just like priests, just like like nuns. And I also see that this notion of theology of the body, it kind of twists the meaning of the dignity of the human person as if you know, the, the body is, is what gives dignity to the human the person. Again, that's not, that's not Catholic tradition. The church has said that while we certainly have dignity from our intellect and will, our intellect and will are wounded. Okay? And it's the intellect and the will that's leading us into these sins. And so we lose our dignity if we use our intellect and will to commit these sins. It's only when we receive the life-giving grace from God through the sacraments that we truly have dignity. So when we talk about human sexuality, we always have to look at it through that supernatural prism. That's very important. And finally, I want to mention uh, something that invariably comes up, natural family planning. When, when People talk about uh, theology of the body. It seems to me that many of the teachers say that this is almost a requirement within marriages, and it's not a requirement within marriages. The popes have been very clear, not just Paul VI and Humanae Vitae, uh, but if you go back to Pius XI uh, and Casti Conubi, Pius XII wrote a wonderful um, uh, missive to the Italian midwives. The church is clear that you know, planning a family is for God to do. It's in his providence. I don't even like the term natural family planning. I'd rather call it periodic abstinence. It's good for periodic abstinence. St. Paul says that is morally permissible, to devote yourself to prayer. But you know, manipulating, manipulating this with, with planning is something that the church uh, has never endorsed. Uh, and so the, the, the NFP advocates to, to say that this is a necessity in marriage. It's not a necessity. In fact, even Paul VI in Humanae Vitae said, and this is for married couples, in Humanae Vitae says if there are grave medical reasons, couples can refrain from the act, but there has to be grave reasons. I think that's, that's important for, for uh, people who are discerning a vocation to marriage uh, to keep in mind, again, because the act is ordered to the procreation of children. So we've covered a lot of material. I want to finish, though, by kind of knowing that this was hard-hitting, and this is tough material even for me to talk about. Uh, it's not, I, I, have, I enjoy talking about other things, quite frankly. But I wanted to hit you hard with this. I do, and I, I've talked to so many priests and, and people who have ministries that say the youth, you guys are under siege. You are so under siege. It's so easy to sin now. You know, I was in high school 25 years ago, and I mean... I knew the temptations that we all face, but they're nothing like what you guys have to deal with. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. How to avoid these sins of impurity. My message to you is, you can do it. You Don't let anybody say you can't control your passions. I believe in you guys that you can do it, that you can be witnesses to our Lord and Our Lady. And I believe in you guys because I believe in Our Lady. I believe if you rely on Our Lady and ask her for purity, she is going to grant your request. So my message is to you that I do believe in you. I know that God is going to give you all the graces you need to live a chaste life. Please, I hope you have a holy fear of God. My intention is to give you that holy fear in this presentation. You know, I heard this many years ago and, and it scared me too. We need to have a holy fear of God. Not a servile or a, a, like a slave. We have to love God as our Father, but we need to fear we need to fear the fate that we could could befall us if we sin. We know that. So how do we avoid these sins of impurity? How do we live chaste lives? How do we give glory to God? I talked about removing all temptations. This is key. 
You have to examine your conscience. If there's something that's leading you into sin, whether it's your cell phone, your internet, the company you keep, the conversations you have, the books you read, all of that, if it's leading you into sin, make a decision today to remove it, to remove that, that obstacle, okay? Because that's what it is. It is an obstacle. But the church provides three other ways, and according to many saints, masters of the spiritual life, they say fasting, avoiding dangerous occasions of sin, and prayer. Now, fasting is key. There's a, there is a relationship between you know, what we eat and, and how our passions are aroused. St. Thomas talks a lot about that in, uh, in his Summa. But uh, ordaining uh, you know, your food, your consumption of food to, to right reason is very important. Believe me, it will help you tame the passions. But I say it's not just food. It's fasting even with the mortification of the eyes. Be careful of what you look at. Okay? That's all part of this fasting. Um, you know that during Lent, you know, we refrain from, from meat. Actually, if you look at the canon law, it's 1251. The church says we should refrain, refrain from meat on Fridays throughout the whole year. How many of us are doing that? Now, the bishop's conference says that you can substitute a penance on Friday, but if you don't substitute a penance, you should be refraining from meat. This is one of the ways the church reminds us to tame our passions. Okay, through fasting. Remember our, our Lord, you know, he, the, the apostles couldn't drive out those demons, and, and Jesus came in and says, well, you can only drive out this one by prayer and fasting. Fasting, when it's coupled with prayer, is powerful. It will drive the demons away. A lot of the church fathers even said that Our Lady, who had no sin, she had no concupiscence, she was pure. They said that even she mortified herself. And that she didn't want to draw attention to herself. She was so beautiful. The fathers talk about when she went to visit her, her kinswoman Elizabeth. And she went in haste. The fathers have commented on What do they mean by she went in haste? She went quickly because she didn't want people to look at her. She was so beautiful, she didn't want to draw men into sin. Not that she had any temptations, because she didn't. She was a perfect creature of God. But she didn't want to draw men into sin. So it's wonderful what the fathers have said about her. St. John Damascene, uh, many other fathers. And so it's the mortification uh, in doing penance with food, with what we're looking at, how we're talking. Uh, all of those things come under the rubric of fasting. The second means I've mentioned is to fly the occasion of sin. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15, it says, He that is aware of the snares shall be secure. If you are aware of the snares, you will be secure. You have to be honest with yourself. And you have to say, is this a situation or an occasion where I could fall into sin? You know the answer to that internally. And if it's the case, I'm telling you, if you put yourself in that occasion, you're going to fall. So we can't do that. St. Philip Neri says that, quote, in the war of the senses, cowards conquer. Isn't that interesting? In the war of the senses, cowards conquer. So I want you guys to be cowards, and I want to be a coward too. I want to flee any occasion. Why? Because I know I'm weak, we're all weak, and if we put ourselves in those occasions, we're going to fall. When you study the spiritual life and you really are working at growing in holiness, there are many vices where the spiritual masters will tell you to confront them head on. For example, if you have pride, you know, you should do an act of humility. Or if somebody really you dislike that person. You should go up and say something nice to that person. Or sloth, if you're lazy, you should get up and do an activity. You know, like St. Ignatius and the Rachites are always countering these vices with the opposite virtues. But sexual vices cannot be treated this way. You cannot meet them head on. Rather, you have to flee from them. It's a completely different animal. Putting oneself in the occasion of a sexual sin is a mortal sin itself, even if you don't commit the sin. The fact that you put yourself willingly in that occasion means you said, I'm going to risk my soul. Even if I don't fall, I'm still going to put myself in an occasion of risking my soul. Okay? That's why it is a grave sin. So we will now flee these from now on, right? We're not going to put ourselves in that occasion. And the third means, of course, is prayer. 
And in the scriptures it says, And as I knew, said the wise man, that I could not otherwise be continent except God gave it, I went to the Lord and besought him. And so prayer is certainly the way that we can overcome these temptations. And all of the spiritual masters and doctors say, if you go to Our Lady, Our Lady, our most pure mother of purity, she will give you all of the graces you need to overcome these sins. People don't, they have to come back to our, our mother. You know, our Savior is Jesus Christ. Without him, we can do nothing. But he has given his mother the graces. She mediates those graces for us. This is what the church says. This is what the fathers say. We need to go to our mother. We're not Protestants. We're Catholics. The Protestants, they don't go to our mother. Well, there's no grace there because Our Lady is the one that dispenses the graces. She is our mother. You know, the fathers called her the nexus or the neck of the church because Christ is the head, the church is the body. They said Mary was the nexus or the neck through whom the graces flow. And so we want to say that we can be confident. We can be confident that we could live chaste lives because we have confidence in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I do believe that if you do desire chastity and you call upon her, you will not fall. And so let us...